This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, brothers and sisters. This is Minister Jerry Spencer from Bank Street Memorial Baptist Church in Norfolk, Virginia. Welcome to the Inspirational Bible Study Ministry. This mission is to bring men and women to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through the study and the teaching of the Word of God. And I just want to welcome everyone this morning. Our scripture will be coming from Acts chapter 26, verses 1 through 11. But before we get started, let us go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would, oh Lord, just let the Holy Spirit now take full control of this Bible study ministry. I pray, oh Father, that you would just bless those who will hear, bless the word. I pray that, Lord, the word may be may be the word of truth and that oh lord i just ask and pray to open our hearts and minds to receive your word in jesus holy name i pray amen our key verse for this morning will be coming from acts chapter 26 verse 6 now it is because of my hope in what god has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. <clears throat> Again, our title, Fearless Witness. Fearless Witness. Next week, Lord's willing, we will be uh, looking at Psalm 71, verses 12 through 21. I believe we'll be going through three Sundays of, or three studies of Psalms. And that the first one will be next week, uh, July 7th. So remember, we're, we're always one week behind. So our next study will be coming from uh, our July 7th study, um, which is in Psalm 71. We ended last week's study with the epistle to the Hebrews, which spoke of a promise that was fulfilled. We know from the scriptures that when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, <clears throat> he swore by himself, saying, Blessing, surely, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. So after Abraham had patiently endured, the scripture says, being a hundred years old, he obtained the promise which began with the birth of Abraham's son, Isaac. Now the scriptures spoke about true believers in Christ Jesus being those who through patience and endurance inherit what has been promised by God. Beginning with Abraham, Genesis chapter 22, verses 15 through 17. So you and I, brothers and sisters, we are recipients of the promised blessings of Abraham. These blessings are not just earthly blessings. So listen to the words spoken by Paul, an apostle of the Lord, who wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, saying, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things which God had prepared for those that love him. Amen. Similar words were found spoken by the prophet Isaiah, who wrote, Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. These verses, friends, should give us give every believer the incentive to wait on the Lord, to be faithful unto death, or rather even until we fall asleep. And when we are awakened, we will receive a crown of life according to the promise of God spoken of in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Remain faithful to your, profession, your confession, your testimony, brothers and sisters, and do not do not turn back into the world and risk losing your heavenly blessings. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, according to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Our God is faithful. He is unchangeable. 
and it is impossible for God to lie. This should give every believer in Christ Jesus the incentive to remain steadfast in the faith as we go through the storms of life, knowing the the immutability of our Creator and God. The promises made to Abraham and the promises made to us are sure promises, promises and hope by which every believer should take hold of in Christ Jesus as an anchor for our souls. Though we are blessed in this world, our eyes should be set on heaven, our final and eternal destination, where true blessings await every true believer. This hope of glory entered the heavenly sanctuary, the scripture tells us, and went behind the heavenly curtain into the Holy of Holies on our behalf. So we know, brothers and sisters, that this hope of glory is none other than Jesus the Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the earthly tabernacle, the high priest of the Old Testament times brought the blood of innocent animals and sprinkled it on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, which was behind the curtain, <clears throat> every year for the sins of the people. But Christ Jesus is our high priest forever. He entered the Holy of Holies in the heavenly tabernacle once, not like the priest who would go every year. Our Savior went into the Holy of Holies in the heavenly places once with his own blood, shedding it once and for all for the life of the world. Christ is our high priest. He is our sacrificial lamb whose blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, whose mercy seat he is. Christ Jesus is prophet, priest, and king, brothers and sisters. Paul said in his salutation to the believers in Rome, he said, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our study today expounds on Paul's words. The backdrop of our study has to do with a man whose name was Saul at first. A man converted on the road to Damascus, whose intent was to bring back to Jerusalem Jews who had believed on the Lord to stand trial. After he was converted, Saul began traveling around the Mediterranean world for three, on three missionary journeys. And during this time, he changed his name to Paul. How interesting, brothers and sisters, how interesting it is that as long as Paul was considered by the people to be a Pharisee and opponent of Jesus Christ, He had no problems with the Jews. But when these same people learned of Paul's conversion and his preaching, they immediately became his enemy. Many of you have also experienced this as well. Many believers in Christ Jesus are being persecuted and even killed by religious groups because they oppose the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, just as it was in Paul's day, believing they were doing God's will. But for Paul, the hunter has now become the hunted. The people incited riots, which led to Paul's arrest. Another riot almost broke out, which would have resulted in Paul being flogged or beaten, had it not been that he was a Roman citizen. But the the enemies of Christ's chosen vessel were determined to end Paul's life by trying to convince Festus, who was a procurer, a a procurator, uh, let me see if I can get this word right, procurator, procurator of Judea and a Roman citizen, They wanted to have Paul sent to Jerusalem. So they tried to convince Festus to send Paul to Jerusalem. 
on the way there, they would am ambush Paul and kill him. Now, Paul was wisely refused to appeal and appealed to take his case before Caesar. <clears throat> and by God's divine providence, Paul remained in Caesarea where the king, whose name was Agrippa II, the last of the Herodian kings, would later visit and would hear Paul's case. This takes us to our study, brothers and sisters. In Acts chapter 26, verses 1 through 3, it says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. And so after introducing, after introducing Paul to the king, Festus then steps down. Paul, brothers and sisters, was a shrewd but intelligent man. He knew that if given the opportunity to defend himself, he would be prepared. He would be ready to preach the gospel if given the chance to speak. And he knew the importance of this occasion. Now that he's been given the opportunity, Paul asks Agrippa, he says, to hear me patiently. This is because he is about to give doctrinal evidence of his defense of the gospel. The defense of the gospel is called apologetics. He knew, Paul knew that Agrippa, being a Jew, was well versed in Jewish customs and questions concerning Paul Christ Jesus and what was called the way which was a phrase first used to associate converted believers with Christ Jesus, according to Acts chapter 9, verse 2. Believers who were of the way were later given the name Christians, according to Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Today, however, the word Christian has been uh, used by many so loosely that it has lost its true meaning. This is why today there is a distinction, brothers and sisters, between the true believer in Christ Jesus, which is the true church, and those who call themselves Christians, yet consciously and willfully live as one who was never regenerated. And this is what's called the false church. The true believer in Christ Jesus, though they may stumble at times, will always strive to walk according to the will of our God and Savior. And when they stumble, and we all do, the Holy Spirit helps by convicting them in order that, they might, that he might guide them back to the path of righteousness. The distinction, therefore, between the true, true church and the false church is that is in uh, the world is that the true church is governed by the Holy Spirit, whereas the false church is governed by man. You can call yourself a Christian, but if you are not truly, if you have not truly believed and accepted Christ as Savior, you do not have the Holy Spirit, who is the proof of the believer's testimony, which Paul, which testimony Paul is about to give. So again, brothers and sisters, an individual may call themselves a Christian, but if they have not received Christ as Savior and received the Holy Spirit, which is the proof of their salvation, they are not a child of God. In verses four and five, Paul says, my manner of life from youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem. All the Jews know, he says. They knew me from the first. If they were willing to testify, 
that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. First of all, Paul wants Agrippa to know of his credentials, his upbringing, if you will. So he takes the opportunity to speak of his heritage and zeal for keeping the law. From his youth to adulthood, Paul studied the law of Moses and strove to give his life to obeying that law. Under the feet of the great teacher Gamaliel, Paul became one of Gamaliel's most zealous students, later becoming a Pharisee. And everyone knew of him. And if he had the opportunity, he says, he would have brought some of them who knew him before the king as witnesses. The believer in Christ Jesus today, whether they be Jew or Gentile, is no different than Paul. Everyone has a story to tell how we lived before we came to Christ. From our youth and into our adulthood, we were known among our peers. We went to school together. We got, got degrees lived a life that was pleasing to us in the world. And like Paul, some of us even rejected Jesus Christ and his doctrine. But when we did believe on the Lord, like Paul, everything changed, brothers and sisters. The Gentiles of Paul's day were not privy to the Jews' religion. They were not a part of the commonwealth of Israel and therefore had no part in the law of Moses. But Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, saying, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time, he's talking to the Gentiles, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Paul is speaking to Gentile converts. He's speaking to us, friends. But whether Jew or Gentile, the scripture tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter if you, are, if you, if you were a, a Pharisee or a professor, a king, or a blue collar worker, if you have not come to the realization that your life is incomplete without God being in it, that without Christ you are walking in spiritual darkness in this world and your soul is in danger of being eternally separated from the God, from God and our God and Savior who created us, then like Paul, your status in life is meaningless meaningless. Paul believed with all his heart that he as a Pharisee was doing God's will when he hunted down believers and had them jailed and killed. He was one of those who had fulfilled the warning Jesus spoke of in John chapter 16 verse 2 saying this. Jesus says this, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone kills you will think they are offering a service to God. But after his conversion, Paul would later say of his, his credentials, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Listen carefully, friends. What turned, what turned an individual like Paul from hunting down believers in Christ, thinking he was doing God's will, to one that is now being hunted by the very peers he grew up with? What would change the lives of many Old Testament prophets who walked in sin to later give their lives as they look to the future. What possessed Peter to request to be crucified upside down, considering himself not worthy to be crucified in the same manner of Christ? 
what turned you and me from a life of sin, being loved by our peers who did the same, many who committed crimes and fell into all manner of evil and sexual immorality to turn and serve the living God. It was because all, both Old and New Testament believers, heard the word of God, the gospel and hope of the promise. And though we may have heard it many times before, this one time, our conscience actually received it. And when this happened, friends, we were touched and convinced or convicted by the Holy Spirit who spoke to our spirit. And like Paul, we responded to the voice of the Holy Spirit and our lives were forever changed. Paul says in Acts chapter 26, verses six and eight, six through eight, he says this, and now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. Now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our 12 tribe, earnestly serving God night and day, hoped, hoped to obtain. For this hope's sake, he says, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. He says, why should it be thought incredible that you, by you, that God raises the dead? Paul targets Agrippa's knowledge of the Old Testament. That's the first thing he does. Remember, Paul is an, is an intelligent individual. He appeals directly to Agrippa's conscience and his knowledge of the law. Agrippa was well versed in the Jews' religion, himself being a Jew, and his knowledge of the Savior, the Messiah. So Paul chooses his words carefully. He knows his audience. There was hope, and then there was what God has promised. So when Paul uses the term our fathers, Agrippa associates this with the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The promises given to Israel according to Genesis chapter 12 through 15 finds its consummation in the resurrection of the Messiah. In other words, brothers and sisters, as far back as the days of the patriarchs and the established nation of Israel, not even the remnant of Israel of Israel gave up on the hope of the resurrection of the dead. This was evident when there was a dispute between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that's according to Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 through 32. So what Paul is being accused of is actually Jewish belief as well, which is the resurrection of the dead for which Jesus clearly announced when he said to the Sadducees that concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, according to Exodus chapter 3, verse 6 and 15. You can look at that as well. He says, God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. So why is Paul being accused of wrongdoing if he is preaching the resurrection of the dead, which even the patriarchs believed? A hope and promise that was brought to fulfillment when Christ Jesus was raised from the dead. Our Lord said, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day, he says. This is the gospel Paul is preaching. This is the promise God has made with all who believe on him. Our Lord goes on to say, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. According to John chapter 11, verse 26, death 
for the will the the willful unbeliever is to be subject to eternal misery and conscious suffering according to revelation chapter 20 verses 14 and 15. however brothers and sisters death for the believer is to fall asleep only to be awakened and raised at our lord's return according to first thessalonians chapter 4 verses 16 and 17. in acts chapter 26 verse 9 paul says indeed i thought myself um, i thought uh, myself that i must do many things contrary to the name of jesus of nazareth indeed i myself he says thought i must do many things according uh, contrary to the name of jesus of nazareth now that he has spoken of hope promises and the resurrection paul continues by telling agrippa that he believed and was convinced that he should do everything in his power to stop the spreading of this so-called false teacher who was spreading false doctrine among the people he was ready to take the lives of those who were of the way paul watched and approved of the stoning of a devout a devout jew and believer whose name was stephen paul was in opposition to the very title of jesus of nazareth a phrase he probably came to detest but paul was a chosen vessel friends and after his conversion he later confesses to his young disciple timothy saying although i was formerly a blasphemer a, pro a persecutor and an insolent man but i obtained mercy because i did it ignorantly in unbelief according to first timothy chapter 1 verse 13. many wrongful things in our lives we have done because of our ignorance friends and like paul we too were given mercy by god because we did these things ignorantly and so paul continues by telling the king in verse in our final verses verses 10 and 11 this i also did in jerusalem and many of the saints i shut up in prison having received authority from the chief priests and and when they were put to death i cast my vote against them and i punished those often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly enraged against them i persecuted them even to foreign cities saul was a man obsessed brothers and sisters with destroying jesus christ and his doctrine paul admits that after his conversion he became just as adamant and obsessed and zealous concerning the law of faith not the law of moses but the law of faith that is in christ jesus alone preaching the resurrection of christ for which he is now being accused and now paul stands before king agrippa as a defender of the faith the hunter brothers and sisters, have now become the hunted. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, your word is truth. I pray, O oh Heavenly Father, that your word will go out and not return to you void. I pray that those who have heard your word today may internalize it, may study it, and may be guided by the Holy Spirit. Eternal God in heaven, we give you the praise and the glory in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And we thank you for your word this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, have a wonderful day. Amen.